This is a brief video on prenatal screening, fetal testing, and other tests that can be performed during pregnancy. We're going to be talking about methods of evaluating mom and baby during pregnancy. And the methods that we're going to be talking about are listed on the left here. So let's get started with ultrasound. Ultrasound is a rather old and well-tested technique that's used in a few other methods listed on the side. It's used in the first trimester to confirm intrauterine pregnancy. This can be uh, intrauterine pregnancy as opposed to an ectopic pregnancy or as opposed to a molar pregnancy. It can also be used in the first trimester to determine gestational age. And it can also be used to see if you have a singleton or multiple births that meaning twins or triplets. In order to determine gestational age, ultrasound can be used to measure the crown rump length, also called CRL. And this measurement for gestational age is most accurate between seven and 10 weeks. If you take a look at this top image on the right here, you see a sample measurement for crown rump length that estimates the gestational age of that fetus to be eight weeks and one day. In the third trimester, ultrasound can be used to assess fetal well-being using the biophysical profile. We'll talk more about that in a few slides. It can also be used to determine baby's position or orientation. For instance, if baby is in a cephalic position, ready for vaginal birth, or is in a breech position and might require a C-section. It can also be used to determine water status and produce results like anhydramnios, oligohydramnios, and polyhydramnios. Ultrasound can be used for fetal anemia screening, in which it's called a transcranial Doppler, and that occurs after 20 weeks. The method here is that high velocity blood means that baby hemoglobin is low. That should be HB on that line there. Um, when the blood is thick and viscous, hemoglobin is high. And therefore, when blood is slow, that means hemoglobin is low and the blood is less viscous. Cardiotachography is a method that uses ultrasound, and it's used in non-stress test, contraction stress testing, and biophysical profile. Those are the next three slides that we're going to be talking about. The major benefit of ultrasound is that it poses no risk to the fetus, and there are rarely any complications that come out of it. It's a very safe method. Now let's talk about the non-stress test. The premise here is that a well-oxygenated, healthy fetus should have spontaneous, temporary increases in heart rate. We call these temporary increases in heart rate acceleration. In a non-stress test, you look at a 20-minute measurement of baby's heart rate using ultrasound, cardiotography, as we talked about on the slide before, and you check for these accelerations. In a normal non-stress test, you expect to see at least two increases in baby's heart rate. These increases should be an increase in at least 15 beats per minute, and they should last for at least 15 seconds. So the 15 for 15 rule is a good rule to remember. In a baby that's less than 32 weeks gestation, you might opt for the 10 for 10 rule for a normal non-stress test. Also required for a normal non-stress test is a baseline heart rate of a of between 110 and 160 beats per minute. The heart rate should have moderate variability. Variability is essentially how much the heart rate changes at baseline, around the baseline. So you can see here that this variability is appropriate. It's probably between right here and right here on the graph. So it might be a, a variability of about 15 to 20, and that would be considered moderate variability. Anything less than six, beats per minute in variability would be minimal variability, and anything more than 25 would be marked variability. But moderate variability is required for non-stress test. And lastly, there can be no late or variable D-cells in a non-stress test, and we'll talk more about those soon. In a contraction stress test, you want to induce contractions to see how baby reacts to those contractions. So this is an assessment of how the fetus will handle contractions of childbirth. 
So again, you want to induce contractions, and that can be done in one of two ways. You can medically induce them using oxytocin, or some parents might opt for nipple stimulation. The point is that you want to achieve three contractions within 10 minutes for a contraction stress test. And we use the units, the Montevideo units, to measure the strength of contractions. And in order for these three contractions to be suitable for a contraction stress test, they must be at least 200 Montevideo units in strength. During a contraction stress test, you want to assess for bradycardia in the fetus, which is its heart rate dropping to less than 110 beats per minute. There are other types of decelerations that you want to watch for in contraction stress test, and we'll talk about those here. An early deceleration is when the fetal heart rate drops in a way that mirrors mom's contractions. So let's go back to the non-stress test slide really quickly. This top graph shows baby's heart rate. This bottom graph shows mom's contractions. If we imagine a contraction on this bottom graph and this top graph would have a decrease in fetal heart rate that looks like a mirror image of mom's contraction, that would be considered an early deceleration. Early decelerations are indicative of head compression in the uterus, and there should be no intervention. Early decelerations are sometimes expected. They're benign. They're pretty healthy. You don't have to do anything about early decelerations as long as they mirror contractions. Variable decelerations show a more abrupt drop in baby's heart rate. They are V-shaped on that graph, and they have a random relation to contractions. Sometimes they happen with contractions, they might not. Um, in general, variable decelerations are indicative of cord compression. There is no intervention in variable compression unless they are recurrent or prolonged. So usually you don't have to do anything about them if you just see one variable deceleration by off chance. But if they become recurrent and if they are for too long, they might be more concerning. Lastly is the late deceleration, and these are the scary decelerations. The late decelerations begin when the contractions peak. So you see that contraction on the bottom curve, and then you see baby's heart rate start to drop. These are indicative of placental insufficiency, and the intervention required here is immediate delivery. Late decelerations are very concerning and always require immediate delivery. If a contraction stress test is positive, that means that at least half the contractions are followed by late decelerations. That qualifies for a positive contraction stress test. Next up is the biophysical profile. The biophysical profile essentially combines the non-stress test with several other ultrasound measurements. The score is based on five criteria, and you can get two points for each criteria for a total score of up to 10 points. This is essentially analogous to the APGAR scores, but for an unborn baby. APGAR is for a newborn, whereas the biophysical profile is for a fetus. The five criteria are listed in this table here. The first criteria is the non-stress test, as we discussed a couple slides ago. To get two points for a non-stress test, you need two accelerations in 20 minutes. If you have any less than that, you get zero points. Another criteria is breathing movements. And if you have one episode of breathing for more than 20 seconds, some people say 30 seconds, in a 30 minute period of ultrasound, then you get two points. If you have no such episodes in 30 minutes, then there is zero points. Third criteria is gross body movements. If you have two torso or limb movements, that is sufficient for two points. Less than two movements is zero points. Next is muscle tone. If you have one bending or straightening of either the limb or trunk, that's good enough for two points. If you have no movements or slow or incomplete movements, that is zero points. The last criteria is amniotic fluid. If you have at least one vertical pocket with a vertical axis that is at least two centimeters deep, then you were good for two points. If your largest vertical pocket is less than two centimeters, then that is zero points. You sum these five criteria together and that score is your biophysical profile. If you have a score of zero to two, you should induce labor immediately. Any score of less than four is generally abnormal. A score of six is equivocal. A score of eight to 10 is normal and reassuring. Another test during pregnancy is the diabetes screen. 
diabetes in pregnancy is defined as diabetes that has been diagnosed later than 20 weeks gestation. And this is called gestational diabetes. Some risk factors for gestational diabetes include a BMI of over 30, a history of prediabetes before pregnancy, a family history of diabetes, an age of over 25, a history of stillbirth, polyhydramnios, macrosomnia, hypertension, steroid use, and PCOS, as well as insulin resistance associated with polycystic ovarian syndrome. To diagnose diabetes in a pregnant mother, you want to perform a one-hour glucose tolerance test in which you essentially give 50 grams of glucose and measure the blood sugar at one hour. If the blood sugar at one hour is above 140, you can proceed to the three-hour test. The three-hour glucose tolerance test entails giving 100 grams of glucose, and then you measure, you measure the blood glucose at zero, one, two, and three hours. If any of those four measurements are above 90, 190, 155, or 140 respectively, then the diagnosis is gestational diabetes. And remember that you need to diagnose gestational diabetes after 20 weeks of gestation. Some other findings for diabetes in pregnancy, which can pose a threat to the baby, include high glucose or prediabetes before pregnancy, high hemoglobin A1C, and type 1 diabetes with anti-insulin or anti-islet cell antibodies. You first want to treat gestational diabetes with diet and exercise, and if that doesn't work, you can try postprandial insulin and metformin and glyburide if insulin is contraindicated in that patient. Another screen during pregnancy is the rhesus screen. The premise here is that allomunization is a concern if mom is Rh antigen negative and baby is Rh antigen positive. If there is any type of blood mixing at all, mom can develop anti-Rh antibodies. Her immune system can then attack an Rh antigen positive fetus, therefore causing fetal anemia. To screen mom, you first want to make sure that mom is Rh antigen negative. Otherwise, you don't need to do this screen. And you check for Rh antibodies. If mom is Rh antibody negative, baby can potentially be Rh antibody positive if dad is Rh antigen positive or unknown. And if that's the case, then you want to use Rogam both at 28 weeks of gestation and at delivery. If mom is Rh antibody positive, specifically for type D, which causes the most allomunization problems, you can perform a transcranial Doppler to assess for fetal anemia. So if you know that mom already has antibodies, you're concerned that the baby in mom might have fetal anemia, and you want to assess for that with a transcranial Doppler. High blood velocities in transcranial Doppler can be indicative of fetal anemia. This is because less viscous blood flows faster, whereas more viscous blood flows slower. So less viscous blood is more indicative of anemia. You also might consider an intrauterine blood transfusion or an early delivery of baby if baby is older than 36 weeks gestation. Another test to do during pregnancy is the anemia screen. One basic equation to understand anemia is that hemoglobin is equal to the red blood cell mass divided by plasma volume. In pregnancy, both of these latter variables increase. The red blood cell mass increases by 30% and the plasma volume increases by 50%. Because the plasma volume increases by more than the red blood cell mass, you're going to have a decrease in hemoglobin. So your hemoglobin physiologically decreases, and this is called a dilutional anemia. The maximum drop that should be physiologic in pregnancy is down to a hemoglobin of 10. That's a hematocrit of 30 at 28 weeks. Any more than this drop, and you're suspicious for pathologic anemia. You screen mom at 28 weeks gestation with either a complete blood count or a hemoglobin and hematocrit. If the hemoglobin is greater than 10 or the hematocrit is greater, excuse me, if the hemoglobin is less than 10 or the hematocrit is less than 30, you can then perform iron studies. 
most commonly found is iron deficiency anemia, in which on iron studies, you would find low ferritin, low MCV, and high RDW. And again, this is the most common cause of anemia in pregnancy. You could treat this by simply adding iron supplements, 30 milligrams per day, which is a 100% increase in the iron that mom is supposed to be getting. <laughs> Another test that can be done during pregnancy is amniocentesis, as shown in this image here. It is a sampling of a small amount of amniotic fluid through the transabdominal needle aspiration, and this typically occurs after 16 weeks of gestation. You can use amniocentesis to diagnose neural tube defects and genetic disorders, including Down syndrome. However, there is a risk to amniocentesis, and that risk for fetal loss is about 1 in 200 or 1 in 300 procedures. There's also a risk for chorioamnionitis, fetal injury, alloimmunization, and early rupture of membranes. The amniocentesis has generally been replaced with the quad screen, which measures maternal proteins indicative of some trisomies and other genetic disorders. It's also been replaced with cell-free DNA, which essentially detects fetal DNA in mom's circulation. So amniocentesis isn't performed as regularly anymore. Another test to perform during pregnancy is chorionic villus sampling. In this test, the chorionic villi are aspirated for cytogenic analysis. Shown here is a micrograph showing the chorionic villi, and this is the tissue that's collected in chorionic villi sampling. The benefit here is that it can be performed very early, as early as 10 weeks, and this allows for early detection, which of course allows for early termination, if the parents so choose. CVS can detect genetic disorders. You can also use it to obtain karyotypes, which of course would detect trisomies, other gene disorders, and it can also be used to measure gene sequences. The risk here is a one in 500 chance of fetal loss. One last test is percutaneous umbilical cord blood sampling, also sometimes abbreviated to PUBS, percutaneous umbilical blood sampling. This is a procedure in which blood is collected from the umbilical vein to detect fetal infections, fetal anemia, RH sensitization, or chromosomal defects. There's two methods of doing the PUBS procedure. You can either do anterior sampling, as shown in that top image, or posterior sampling, as shown in that bottom image. Anterior versus posterior sampling depends on the position of the fetus in the uterus and the position of the placenta. PUBS is performed after 18 to 20 weeks of gestation and before 34 weeks of gestation. So this is generally late detection of genetic disorders and chromosomal defects. If PUBS detects fetal anemia, you can then perform a transcranial Doppler to confirm. And one of the major advantages of PUBS, and this is a unique benefit, is that it creates vascular access. So the only way to transfuse baby, the only way to give blood to baby, such as in the cases of fetal anemia, would be through PUBS. And this is a fix, or at least a treatment, for fetal anemia. This has been a video on prenatal screening and fetal testing and tests during pregnancy. I hope it was helpful, and thank you for listening.